Hey guys, welcome to another episode of This Week in BJJ. My name is Budo Jake, and today is May 6th, 2015. We got four things to talk about today. We're gonna to talk about custom BJJ patches, Kali Cure, we're gonna announce the winner of the Q5 uh, supplement giveaway from last week, and also we're gonna have an interview and techniques by Jiva, the arm collector, Santana. So I started out in traditional martial arts where we weren't encouraged to wear patches of any kind on our geese. It was stark white geese was the way to go, uh, sometimes maybe a blue one depending on the art. But in jiu-jitsu we have a lot of freedom to wear almost whatever we want. So custom patches is something that a lot of people want. You want to show off your school and uh, maybe any various other things. But we make patches for a lot of different guys here at Budo Videos. Here's some we made for Robert Drysdale. Uh, here's one for another team. This Valhalla, maybe. Uh, so yeah, a lot of different things. The, the colors are unlimited, and the size. There's various uh, sizes that are available. Uh, prices start as low as ten dollars. You can make just one if you want, or if you want to make um, a larger, you know, 100, 200 pieces for your school. That, that's something we can do as well. So you can order these on unbudovideos.com or we also started a new website called custombjjpatch.com. Same exact service, same pricing on either side. It's just a little bit easier to navigate on custombjjpatch.com because that's all we're doing on that site. So, you know, if you want to make something cool uh, and customize your gi, that's definitely a great way to go. Custombjjpatch.com. Next up, let's talk about Q5. Uh, last week we had a contest to give away some Q5 products. If you don't know what Q5 is, they're a fantastic brand. They make uh, all kinds of supplements from proteins to veggie supplements, fruit supplements, uh, energy supplements, all kinds of stuff. Um, really high quality stuff and they are a fantastic sponsor of the show. So again, I want to thank them for that. So we're giving away a couple uh, products and um, it was all based on the comments from last week. And we just took at random, uh, we took a name from the list and it's Matt Schellenschlager, congratulations Matt. Pick out two Q5 products, anything you want, and uh, just send me an email at twibjj at budovideos.com. Once again, twibjj at budovideos.com. Hopefully you're in the US because the contest was only open for US uh, residents. But anyway, uh, send me an email and we'll get those two items out to you. Uh, one more thing to talk about before we get to the interview, uh, and that is cauliflower ear. If you've been grappling for a while, you've probably dealt with this annoying issue of cauliflower ear. That's when uh, the skin gets pulled apart from the cartilage on your ear and it fills up with blood. And um, some people consider that a badge of honor, um, but other people that work more in a professional environment might not want that, or you might have a wife or girlfriend that does not want that. Uh, it's happened to me a couple times and I didn't want it. And what, what I did is what most people do is just get a, a rather large needle and you, you drain the blood out of it. The problem is usually it fills right back up. So it's something that you have to keep doing. And for some people it seems like it works, but for me it just kept filling up. And then at that point you are left with a decision. You can let it harden and then you have a permanently disfigured ear. Or I went the extreme way. I went to the doctor and got it sutured, which means they put thread through your ear. Uh, they, first they take out the blood, they put thread through your ear and hold it tight for about a week and that's a lot of pressure on your ear. It's, it's rather painful but uh, now as you can see I've got these beautiful uh, well-defined ears here. But now there is another solution. It's called Kali Cure. This is something that just came out and it's a rather interesting product. It comes with four different magnets. So what you do is you drain your ear. So once the blood is out then it's just your skin that you need to adhere back to the cartilage. And you do that by pressure, by keeping that pressure on the same thing that I did at the doctor, which cost me, you know, more than $100. Um, you can do now at home. So what you do is you get two of the, uh, the magnets, and they're of varying sizes. So you just get whichever ones fit your ear the best. And these are not uh, hard magnets. These are magnets covered in silicone. They're very soft to the touch. I know you can't feel this, but if you can hear it, you know, it hardly makes any sound because they're very soft. So what you do is, say if the area was right here, you'd put one magnet in here and then reach around to behind your ear and put the other one right behind it. 
So there's a considerable amount of pressure there on my ear right now. It's not uncomfortable, again, because of the softness of the material. And then you would just keep that on probably for about a week or so until the skin is adhered back to the cartilage. So this is a really cool uh, product from Colicure, and it's something that I would definitely try if I'm ever misfortunate enough to have another cauliflower ear incident. The sets run $99.95, and you'll only need one because uh, they don't wear out. You can use them over and over again. So I think it's a, it's a great product, and it's available right now on BoodleVideos.com. Okay, guys. Oh, there's another free t-shirt, too. For a limited time, if you place your order at Buddha Videos, you get a cool Kali Cure t-shirt. Okay, now it's time for the interview. This was one that we did last week with Jiva Santana. Jiva is known as the arm collector because he's very good at arm bars. And he leads the jiu-jitsu program at Lotus Club in, uh, right here nearby in Irvine. Uh, he's a fantastic teacher. Uh, it was a fun interview and uh, he shows some really cool techniques at the end. He shows what he calls, well his friends call, he wasn't, uh, he's, he's too humble to claim it himself, but other people refer to it as the De La Jiva Guard. I was very intrigued by it and uh, it did not disappoint. I think you're gonna like it as well. A couple other interesting things he talks about during the interview. He talks about why swearing when you get swept or submitted during class is the worst thing you can do. He also talks about why he prefers arm bars over chokes, particularly in MMA competitions. And, um, and yeah, that's about it. I think you're really going to enjoy the interview and the techniques for sure. So enjoy the show, and we'll see you guys later. So Jiva, there's a logo on the wall, Lotus Club. I don't know anything about the Lotus Club. Can you tell me where it came from? Uh, Lotus Club was founded in 1989 for Master Moisés Muraj. Him and his brother, Ali and uh, Elias, they found a lot of school in 1989 uh, in the, uh, Santana, that's the, 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 the city, and like a north side of Sao Paulo capital, and that's when it started. And then since then, it's kept growing slowly, but keep growing. And uh, I joined a lot of school in 1994. I was, as I got promoted to a purple belt, I joined a lot of school. At first I trained with uh, Professor Arlen Smile. I was in the Army, and that's when I started inside the Army. I was training with him like, consistently, and, like one-on-one -on -one most of the time, because he needs training and have nobody to train, so he decided to help me. Mm -hmm. And then he had got transferred through the Army to, back to Rio, and I was in Sao Paulo, and then he was like, you gotta go join those guys, and that's why I am too now. Most people know of Jiu-Jitsu uh, through Rio de Janeiro. Of course, that's where the, most of the Gracies were living. Yeah. How was Jiu-Jitsu developed in Sao Paulo? There's a, different, a lot of different ways, like Grand Masters in Sao Paulo, like Mas, Master Orlando Saraiva, he trains with the Carson in Rio. Then he moved to a countryside in Sao Paulo, and he started Jiu-Jitsu in there. There's a, many others, like old masters that came through M Master Car Carson. Moisés started training with the Master Orlando Saraiva, and then when he moved to Sao Paulo capital, then he started training with the uh, Master Otávio de Almeida Sr. And that's when it started developing jiu-jitsu more in St. Paul. I see. Are there any distinguishing characteristics, anything unique about Lotus Club jiu-jitsu? I know nowadays we all are influenced by everybody else, but is there anything unique about Lotus Club? Lotus Club, is, uh, it was developed at the beginning as most like uh, jiu-jitsu for like everybody that can do a jiu-jitsu and uh, most like a healthy way to live, like be healthy, train, take it off the body, you know, and uh, be f like fit like on a good way, not like everybody that goes in there because you have like a fathers, you know, people all, all of ages going to train. So that was the first uh, mentality. But then you get people that come to the sport and they love the sport more and they want to go farther and then they start competing. And that's when they start developing the competition side and then the people that go just for the love of the art and for enjoying. Lotus Club is mostly like at the, at the main gym in Sao Paulo, there's tons of competitors in there, but we have classes that's just like, you can say that's non-competitor. It's not that people that compete uh, cannot go to the class, they will go, but the mentality and then the, what you expect for the class is something different, you know. It's like a lot of workouts that everybody can go through, can work and can leave the gym feeling well. So my impression of jiu-jitsu and 
the 90s and even earlier in Brazil was that it was very closely tied to Vale Tudo and the public's perception of jiu-jitsu was maybe a negative one of, of street fighters. Was that the reality? In certain part was because jiu-jitsu got known uh, on, uh, on Brazil because of the Vale Tudo. You know, Helio Grace and all the family and everything. So everybody from outside jiu-jitsu that was not part of the community, they associate jiu-jitsu a lot with the Vale Tudo, violence and all those things. But at a certain point, uh, it was like, it's a conflict. You know, you do jiu-jitsu, you're one of those guys, you know, you're that guy. And then, uh, and it took a while to people start like associating more. But like middle 90s, jiu-jitsu in Sao Paulo grew like, like, like a lot. Like it was like a small community. No one used much about a jiu-jitsu. And suddenly like, it was like huge competitions going on. Before I remember like we go into a competition like 100, 200 people. And then like after like mid, middle 90s, like 94, 95, the competition started to get like huge. Like, 500 people, 1,000 people is going to compete in Sao Paulo. Even people from Rio come to Sao Paulo to compete because the level started getting good. And that mentality kind of changed a little bit. Like people are like, oh, this is a sport and this is a, a it's a value to it. So they start understanding better and they associate a little bit uh, jiu-jitsu sport from the, the value to them. And then we started to have like a small uh, Vale Tudo shows in Sao Paulo too that people could say like, oh, this is a Vale Tudo, this is Jiu Jitsu, and then mm -hmm. I think start getting better. But far, far than look like how look right now. You know, right now people understand way better. They know what Vale Tudo is. It's in the main TV in Brazil nowadays, and they understand Jiu Jitsu as a sport, mm -hmm. which is good for everybody. Like for me, it was a hard because like every time I had to, I decide to do Jiu Jitsu and leave it through Jiu Jitsu and make my living through jiu-jitsu and sometimes you go on meetings you meet people that's not from the community it's like what do you do i teach jiu-jitsu like oh you're not gonna punch me it's like it's kind of like that bad side as like and people knew me by my personality like oh you know violent what are you doing jiu-jitsu for it's like it's nothing to do what you think it is you know i should try out a class and you're gonna change your your way to see how this part is right so you've competed in jiu-jitsu competitions and also MMA fights. You've had a lot of MMA fights. Yeah, I do. There's a lot of reasons why jiu-jitsu guys go the MMA way. Some, a lot of guys do it for money. Some guys want to test themselves or test their jiu-jitsu. Why did you go to MMA? My, my, uh, my was interesting. It was a mixing of things. At first, it was like, you know, like when you compete for so many years, uh, you start getting a bow pain waiting for the for your match on jiu-jitsu mm -hmm. and start getting boring like you know like oh man I gotta wait again and then I was like I was feeling like my passion wasn't going away my adrenaline wasn't wasn't present anymore and then I like to compete my whole life was competing I started jiu-jitsu already competing even though what it was what it was competition I was competing like my professor like just sign me up like here goes like then I I was in there so and then I was like, I gotta change a little bit. I need more adrenaline. Maybe I'll try uh, Vale Tudo or MMA. And then there was this thing too that most of the black belts at the time, they all had one or two fight in MMA just to, if you're gonna teach MMA one day, at least you know by being inside the cage what feels like, what it is for real. Because there's a lot of people tells you what to do, but at a certain point of the fight, if you never be inside, you don't know what's going on. There's yeah. no way you can understand what's going on. And I was like, yeah, yeah I'll try one and see how it goes. And uh, it was funny because I was finishing college and I had this huge opportunity to fight in Korea. It was a 16-man tournament mm. for my debut. Wow. And it was heavyweight. And the guy said, hey, you want to go? It's a good money, good pay. And my, at the time, the pride was going crazy in Japan. I was Korea, I was like, Korea, Japan, you know, maybe I do a good match in there, have a good fight. Maybe like someone seeing there and I find my way to pride and, you know, fight MMA. Then I, went, I ended up going there, I was like 16 main tournament, and I ended up winning the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Four fights on the same night. And I ended up winning three fights by armbar, one by points. Didn't know much about striking or anything. And that's how I start. Mm -hmm. And then I saw like fight after fight, fight after fight. And, but I always try, through MMA, I always try to represent Jiu Jitsu because that's what I was came for, even training all the others, uh, striking, wrestling, everything. 
I always see the way of the kick. I come from Jiu Jitsu so many years doing it. Mm -hmm. And my whole mentality when I was fighting MMA, I was I was always like think like this. If I got this guy down, there's no way I name I'll name guys that my division, my competition. There's no way that this guy can hold my pressure like for example, like a solo like Damien, like Jacare, people that are my same weight, and we know what the pressure feels like against the black belt. Either way, like either taking the pressure, putting pressure on someone, you know what it takes. So my whole idea is like, if I got this guy down, there's no way he's like another black belt that I fought. And I was like, he's done. And then that's how I always see. That's how I, I try to give this to myself like this, keep that in the back of my mind. And out of the 21 fights I had, I finished. 16, 16, yeah, I finished 16, one by point, one TKO, 13 arm bars, 10 on the first round consecutive, 10 arm bars on the first round, and I think I represent Jiu Jitsu well. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, what is it about the arm, arm bar? I know your, call, your nickname is the Arm Collector. Yeah. What, what do you like about the arm bar? It's funny because when I was like competing in Jiu Jitsu, I loved chokes. But the arm bar, that's come from Jiu Jitsu self defense, mm. right? In the back of my mind, I was like, okay, this guy punched hard. So, I better attack his arm because if I break his arm, even if you don't tap, I'm pretty sure you're not going to punch me with that arm. Mm -hmm. And every time you grab the arm, it's one, one last weapon for the opponent. Mm -hmm. You cannot punch with the arm that you're grabbing. And if you grab one, they're going to punch with the other one. That's when, is the, that's when I see the open for the arm bar. Mm -hmm. You hold one, you're going to open up the other one to punch. And that's when I see the opening for arm bar. And I never played that. Finish all the fights for armbar and ever playing that, but it just happened naturally. Like I was gonna like, okay, it might be you know you want to go fight like a night before. I was like, oh, I might not pull the armbar today. So, but every interview that people ask me, so you're gonna be an armbar. I was like, man, if I pull his nose and he tap, I'll take it anytime. You know, any way to finish this guy as quick as possible. But then like the position, the situation gets me to the point. I was like, oh, armbar again and. I have this way that when I hold the arm in a certain position, I know if I have an arm bar. Because I start doing over and over, and when I grab your elbow, for example, I know which way you're gonna turn to get rid of my grip. And that way that you turn, it might not be the best way for you, mm -hmm. but it might be the best angle for me. And when I'm talking about arm bars, like, everybody see the picture of the arm straight, right? But like, the last thing I do when I get an arm bar is straight. I get an all awkward angle so you don't have the pulling or anything. And then when the last thing you see, your arms are straight and you got a tap. That's why I, I started doing arm bar. And nowadays, like, I see, like, man, arm bar again, again, and again. It's like, wow, I, I guess that's how it is. You know, but I love chokes. I love any other submission. It's just natural, especially for MMA, because it's a weapon. An arm's a weapon for a opponent. That's right. Did you enjoy your experience in MMA? Besides the money, did you enjoy the competition? I enjoy, in the beginning I enjoy, and then it happened the same thing that was happening in Jiu-Jitsu before. I started getting bored on a, on a, on a backstage, like, oh, okay, I'm gonna fight, man, I'm tired of this. And I was, it's funny because I was talking with other people, we have this conversation on the back of our head. If you could speak out, out, out loud, you're gonna see many people have the same conversation. You talk to God, you tell them, okay, if you protect me on this one, I promise it's the last mm -hmm. one. I won't do this again, I won't come here again. It's the last one. And then next thing you see, you're dead again. Okay, I know I asked you last time, <laughs> but I promise you this time, and I keep on going. And then I hit a point that I'm 40, 43 now, but I stopped with the 41, that I love Jiu Jitsu so much that everything for me is Jiu Jitsu. I think Jiu Jitsu, my wife, she calls me avatar sometimes because I'm sitting down. I, same position, like, hey, hey, hey. I was like, what? It's like, it was like, what? It's like, I've seen something here. <laughs> you know, so I got this thing. And I thought, like, for my age, I could keep fighting. I still spar a lot here, like, helping people get ready to fight. But I got to that point, it's like, if I got an injury now, it's going to be serious. And if it's something that's going to take me away from jiu-jitsu, I can't do it anymore, you know? So I want to go back and roll like the way that I was rolling here today, being happy and doing this as long as I can. So I was like, ah, oh, the money is not worth it. my injuries right now. So I'll, I'll, I'll call. I'm good. I'm, I think it was a successful 18 and 3. So I think it was a good career. So I could prove a point that jiu-jitsu is is efficient when you know how to use an MMA, and I'm happy with it. 
and I enjoy it. And then now I'm enjoying competition back again. Mm -hmm. Now I get to uh, I'll get to the bullpen. I was like, man, that's nothing compared to MMA. Right. No one's gonna punch me in the face. Worst case, it might get hurt if I fall wrong, if I slip wrong, if I'm take too long to tap bottom in there. No cut on the face, no punch, no brain damage, no nothing. You know, so I'm good. So I'm having fun in jiu-jitsu again. You should be happy here in MMA because you're doing something. You're here because you want to be here, because you enjoy the art. It, it's going to take a while for you to be able to be laughing and have fun on the mat. Mm -hmm. But until past that point, you should be like, oh, everything that happens, it's going to help. It's a journey.